welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, major domo of this mansion of the mysterious and the macabre. We complain that so many of the old values are lost on this new generation. And it may be true. But consider some of our old values. We were told to look before you leap. But we were also told, he who hesitates is lost. Obviously, there has always been a problem in communication. As the philosopher said, we must simplify. Simplify and clarify. Our mystery drama, Marry for Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. are looking for something, and if we want it badly enough, perhaps we might visit the office of James Kellogg. James is a private detective, and he specializes in finding things for people. On a philosophical level, we might speculate, to whom does Jim go when he has to find something for himself? Well, where does a doctor go when he needs an operation? What does a barber do when he wants a haircut? Anyhow, I've been described as a private detective, and right off, I would like to straighten everybody out on some basic facts. Fiction has made a pretty good thing out of my profession. You know, the luscious blonde with the inviting eyes who enters the office all afire with passion. I don't get cases like that. I don't get sapped on the skull and wake up in the arms of a gorgeous redhead. You want to know what I get? I usually get what just walked into my office this morning. Fat and 50-ish. And what do you think her problem is? I want you to know, Mr. Kellogg. I investigated you thoroughly before coming here. As indeed you should, Mrs. Melvin. An influential member of the family personally discussed the matter with the district attorney and asked him to recommend someone. Your name was suggested. Now that you're here... I shall explain exactly why we deemed it advisable to engage a private eye. One moment, Mrs. Melvin. I am not a private eye. I am a private detective or a confidential investigator. Please continue. Here is our problem. Our problem? I am acting for the family. My two brothers and myself. We decided this would be the wisest course of action. We have a sister who was about to make a dreadful mistake. Yes? Anne's husband died a year ago. He was in the hardware business and left a large amount of money. How large? Is that germane to this discussion? One never knows. After taxes, two million dollars. That's large. Continue. Anne intends to marry again. This is the dreadful mistake? Yes. How old is your sister? Oh, just 40. Well, isn't she mature enough to know what she's doing? Ah. Oh. She's a babe in the woods. She's always led a sheltered life. She knows nothing of the world. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the man in question is younger than your sister. How did you know? Well, Mrs. Melvin, this is not a unique situation. Well, I... uh, The family wants this thing broken up. Why? Because you're afraid her money will go to her new husband and not be available to you? Now, see here, Mr... Be realistic. How can I or anybody break up this romance if she's determined to marry him? By exposing him for what he is. What is he? A thief. A confidence man. Well, if you know this, then he's already been exposed. Oh, that's just it. We don't know it for a fact. Then how can you say it? Because it's true. It must be true. Why? A fellow like him, smooth, sneaky. Oh, and he seems so much younger. Is your sister attractive? That is not the point. Walter Jones is too glib. That's his name? Walter Jones? Yes. What does he do? Oh, he says he's come to town to open a sales office. What kind of sales office? Well, I don't know. He's obviously a swindler and a sharper. And if so, he must have been in trouble with the law at one time or another. Have you discussed this with your sister? Oh, she's so thoroughly infatuated she won't listen to a single word against him. But if, if you could come up with solid evidence of a criminal record, I am convinced we could nip this thing in the bud. Well, suppose he has no criminal record. Impossible. One look at his face It could you... take a great deal of my time and your money to find out. I consider that money well spent. 
It's an investment in my dear sister's happiness. On the other hand, even if this evidence does exist, it may not do you any good. What do you mean? Well, suppose your sister's so much in love with this man that she decides to marry him anyhow. You just find that evidence. Well, I'll need... Uh... I know what you'll need. I've prepared a sheet of paper listing this infamous person's address, the places he frequents, and so on. Here's his photograph. It's an excellent likeness. Hmm. You've come well prepared. I'm paying you for your time. I won't have you waste one single moment. I expect a detailed report of your progress. That's one thing you can be sure you'll get out of all this, Mrs. Melvin. A report. A nice, neat, concise, leather-bound report. Cut the motor, Walter, darling. Oh, it's so lovely out here. Let's drift for a while. Let's lie back and look up at the sun and not go anywhere. Yes, why not? Isn't that really what we're doing? And, dearest, what do you mean? Aren't we just drifting, not getting anywhere? I know. Let's get married. I want that, dear, more than anything in the world. Well, then why don't we get married tomorrow? Where? Anywhere. There are enough judges, clergymen. No, dear. You really don't want to marry me, do you? Now, what you're saying is let's go off and get married. Well, yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and your family will say, aha, we were right. About what? You know about what. Right in thinking there's something shady about me. See, he stole her away. No, I want us to be married properly. Oh. And you do, too. You know, dear, you're really a very old-fashioned uh, conservative girl at heart. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, yeah, you want a formal wedding surrounded by your family and friends. Let my sister and her brother say that they won't come. Very well. We gave them their chance. Uh, darling, a marriage should be forever. Even though we both had previous experiences that, that might deny it. However, this is the real one for each of us. Oh, yes, darling. It is. I know it is. Then let's be patient. Perhaps for just a little while. Oh, I've been patient with my stupid sister long enough. Well, let's give them a little more time. And when they get to know me better... I don't care. Darling, I'm doing this for you. If it were up to me, we'd be standing before a justice of the peace tonight. But your family means so much to you. You want their approval. So, let's wait a little while. All right, darling. But that's going to be a very little while. Greetings, Lieutenant. What can I do for you, James? Well, I'm looking for a baddie. That is, he may be. Walter Jones. Name ring a bell? No bell at all. Walter Jones. Hmm. But, um... Edgar. In a big file under J. Jones. First name, Walter. See if there's a make. Yeah. Name could be a phony. What's he supposed to have done? Well, I don't know what he's done exactly, Lieutenant. I only know what he wants to do. He wants to get married. Has that become a crime? Well, maybe it ought to be. Outrage, prospective in-laws, blushing bride with two million bucks clutched in her hand like a lollipop. And friend Walter, out to snatch it away from her. Hmm. Well, some guys have all the luck. Lieutenant Martin. Yeah, Edgar? Oh, thanks. Sorry, James. How about the listing from the Federals? A blank. And Edgar check. The all states wanted pulled to two. Well, can we cross-file him, Lieutenant? It means we'll have to look at a lot of pictures. Well, you might want him one day yourself. Uh, what's this guy's M.O.? Well, if he has one, he's a confidence operator. Makes a habit of marrying wealthy widows. This uh, mugshot here on the file. Here's your guy in the picture. Walter Jones. It's his real name. Age 33. Did two years for stock swindle. That's the only rap they ever got him on. But look at what he beat. Yeah. Suspicion of homicide. Carolyn Jones, wife. Released lack of evidence. Tried for murder. Julia Jones, wife. Acquitted. Yep. And now does the mad wife killer strike again? A lieutenant suspicion will get us nowhere. And the time that he was tried for it, he beat it. I don't know what we can do. The fraud thing, he's already paid for. The suspicious stuff... Neither here nor there. Legally, he's innocent. So, he cannot be arrested. He can't be stopped. I'm not out for an arrest, Lieutenant. All my clients sent me to the store for was information, and I got it. 
Thanks, Lieutenant. And thank your department for your courtesy and cooperation. This piece of paper is even more than I dared hope for. Not only is he a thief, he is also a murderer. Now, that hasn't been proved. What do you plan to do with this information? Hmm. Rest assured, I shall use it in a manner which I deem to be most effective. Well, then I'd say the case is closed. You'll receive a bill for my services. Hmm. And I'll wager all you did to earn your exorbitant fee was to go down to police headquarters and ask a few simple questions. Well, Mrs. Melvin, it's not just a question of who you know. It's what you know. Hello? Phyllis? Oh, yes, Anne, dear. How are you? Phyllis, I want to invite you to my wedding. Do you? Now, I don't want you to go into an entire three-act play about it. Walter and I intend to be married this coming Sunday at St. Maurice's at four. You and the rest of the family can come and give us your blessing, or not as you see fit. I asked you. Darling, what makes you think we wouldn't come? Phyllis, what are you saying? Four o'clock, of course we'll be there. And then we'll have a reception at my house. Phyllis. And darling, I'm so happy for you. Now, let me call everyone. Goodbye, dear. I'll talk with you later. <laughs> what do you think of that? What is it, Anne? They're coming. My family's actually coming. All of them? Roy and Bob, everyone. Well. Phyllis calls a shot. I told you they'd see the light eventually. Now, aren't you glad we didn't run off somewhere and have this most meaningful and beautiful ceremony performed among strangers? You were right, dear. You're always right. Stick to your own point of view, dear. Eventually, people come around. Oh, Walter. I don't know what I'd ever do without you. Don't worry, Anne, darling. You'll never be without me. Phyllis? Yes, dear? What's keeping him? Oh, he, he may have been delayed in traffic. He's late. Now, dear, you must calm yourself. Something's happened to him. Nothing has happened to him. You did something to him. Me? <laughs> Why, what could I possibly do? I don't know. Something I can tell by the look on your face. Oh, no, Anne. I know that look since we were children. Oh. You've had that wise, superior, all-knowing look. I don't know what you're talking about. Whenever you were trying to put something over on me. But what could I be putting over on you? You're at the bottom of this. Of what? Of Walter's disappearance. Who says Walter's disappeared? But why isn't he here? No, Phyllis, you did something. You swore that you would break this up. But that was before I got to know Walter. This is your doing. It's not going to work, though. Somehow, some way, I am going to find Walter if it takes me the rest of my life. And... and every dollar that I have in this world. I'm going to find Walter. Nothing can keep us apart. Nothing. Nobody. <laughs> Well, there's a ringing endorsement for you. But what did happen to Walter Jones? You know perfectly well he's not going to show up at the church. But why not? Assuming the information on him in the police files is correct, isn't that his thing? Doesn't he marry rich women? Obviously, we have a lot of ground to cover. And the second act will be with you in just a few moments. Some men can marry for love, and some can marry for money. And happy is he who can marry for both. Walter Jones, now. He appeared to be in an ideal situation. He seemed to be in love with Anne. And seven figures are required to describe Anne's fortune. So why did Walter leave Anne at the church? What does private investigator Jim Kellogg think? I didn't think anything about it, if you must know. Actually, as far as I was concerned, the case was closed. I'd already forgotten Walter Jones and Mrs. Melvin and her sister Anne until one morning when my secretary came into my office. Uh, in case the mention of the word secretary causes you to conjure up certain romantic fantasies, I must disappoint you again. My secretary wears pince-nez glasses and has snow-white hair, and the only reason I hired her is because she is the most efficient human being I ever encountered. 
Yes, Mrs. Haskell. And Mrs. Trainer's here to see you. Oh, in reference to what? I believe it will concern a missing person. Mm-hmm. But I, I am somewhat puzzled. You puzzled, Mrs. Haskell, by what? Her face. It seems quite familiar, but I just don't know why. Mrs. Trainer entered my office. Looking at her, I'd say she was somewhere between 35 and 40. And still looking at her, I'd say she was one of the most attractive women I'd ever met. But that was beside the point. Mrs. Haskell was right. There was something strangely familiar about this woman. But I couldn't place it either. I... I don't know how I feel about all this, Mr. Kellogg. What do you mean? I was walking down the street and it started to rain. I stepped into the lobby of this building just to get out of the wet. And I glanced at the directory and there was your name, James Kellogg, private investigator. And right then and there I said to myself, why shouldn't I hire a private detective? Why do you feel you need one? I'm terribly worried. My fiancé has disappeared. Yes? I don't know what more I can tell you. How long has he been gone? It's three weeks. He... The truth is, he left me waiting at the church. Sorry to hear that. I went to his apartment. The superintendent told me that he... He had moved out. No forwarding address? None. Did you talk to his friends, his family? He has no family. And I never met any of his friends. You see, Mr. Kellogg, it was one of those whirlwind courtships. We were just two people who met and fell in love and decided to get married. Mm. Well, you know, there are certain people, as the wedding date approaches, who just... Well, they just become frightened and take off for a little while. No, I refuse to believe that Walter did that. I am sure something terrible must have happened to him. Well, we'll see what we can do, Mrs. Trainer. Uh, were you widowed or divorced? My first husband died. I see. And uh, what is your fiancé's name? Walter Jones. I beg your pardon? Jones. Walter Jones. Yes. Walter Jones. That's why she looked familiar. She was the sister of that impossible Melvin woman. Same shape to the face, same color in the eyes, only on Mrs. Trainer it all looked good. However, this was not the time to admire the physical attributes of Mrs. Trainer. I was now confronted with a problem which seldom, if ever, troubles most fictional detectives. The little matter of professional ethics. He just disappeared suddenly without a trace. And your first name? Anne. You have a family? Oh, yes. A sister and two brothers. Mm-hmm. Oh, what was their attitude towards your fiancé? They were violently opposed. They thought that Walter was after my money. But that's impossible. You sure? Of course. And talking about money, I have plenty of it. So you needn't spare any expense in looking for Walter. Excuse me. Yes. I've been thinking why that Mrs. Trainer looked so familiar. Finally, it came to me. Could it be she's related to that Mrs. Melvin? Yes, precisely. And it concerns uh, an allied matter. It will therefore be necessary for us to adopt an attitude toward the situation, Mrs. Haskell. But don't you bother. I'll come out to see you. You'll take the case, won't you, Mr. Kellogg? Would you excuse me for just one moment? My secretary has a most urgent problem. Guess what she wants. I would assume she wants you to find her fiancé. Obviously, her sister, Mrs. Melvin, didn't tell her that she hired me earlier to dig up Walter's past nor any of the specifics of that past either, or she would have mentioned it. The question is, can I accept Mrs. Trainer as a client? Oh, why not? Well, wouldn't that be the same thing as working both sides of the street? But not at the same time. Mrs. Melvin hired me to break up the marriage. Did she? Well, maybe not. I mean, I never agreed to do that. Oh, of course not. How could you? All I was required to do was to secure certain information concerning Walter Jones. Exactly. And your client was satisfied. Now, another client, quite by coincidence, also wants information concerning the same Walter Jones. Specifically, his whereabouts. Now, is there any legitimate reason why I shouldn't take the case? None that occurs to me at the moment. Only one thing puzzles me. Yes? What can a woman with her looks and charm see in a phony like this Walter Jones? Tell me, Mr. Kellogg. Is that a legitimate area of curiosity for a private detective? Well, I'm... 
I'm talking now as a man. Mrs. Trainer, tell me everything you know about Walter Jones. Well, I don't know very much. I only know I, I love him. Well, shouldn't marriage require a firmer foundation? Such as? Well, I would assume knowing something about each other's habits, tastes, attitudes, so forth. And how much did you know about your wife before you married her? I've never been married. Well, then you hardly qualify as an expert. Still, it would seem that a successful union is based upon mutual interests, knowledge of each other. You keep saying it's important to know all about the person you intend to marry. I say nonsense. Pure, unadulterated nonsense. Love at first sight. That's what it was between Walter Jones and me. Love at first sight. It's the only real way. Mr. Kellogg, have you begun work on Mrs. Trainer's case yet? Yes, Mrs. Haskell, I have. Oh, do you suppose you have any operational reports for me to type? Seems a shame to turn a man like Walter Jones loose on Mrs. Trainer. That's not our problem, Mr. Kellogg, is it? No, no. Uh, do you want me to hire some temporary operatives? Mrs. Haskell, do you believe in love at first sight? Oh, I remember 45 years ago, I was standing on a street corner. A young man drove past and splashed mud all over my legs. I didn't think women showed their legs in those days. Oh, I had lifted my skirt to step over the puddle. And the young man apologized profusely. We looked at each other. Then and there, we knew. We both knew. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, I'll be leaving town for several days, Mrs. Haskell. With whom did you fall in love at first sight? Now, that is a ridiculous question. <laughs> I didn't have to ask. Sergeant, I understand about seven years ago you were the arresting officer in the Julia Jones murder case? Uh, yeah. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't a murder, so it never even got to be a case. What happened? Oh, she was an older dame. They went out in their boat. She drowned. He claimed she fell overboard. Pretty heavy insurance there. And so the relatives started pointing fingers. How'd it work out? Well, I just booked him on suspicion. The DA figured he didn't have enough for an indictment. The thing just dissolved. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Well, I guess we'll never know, huh? Mr. Thorpe, I understand you're the attorney who prosecuted Walter Jones a few years ago for the murder of his wife, Betty. I was the assistant, and uh, that little case may have cost the DA his job. I never saw anything fall apart the way that one did. Did he murder his wife? You haven't murdered anybody until the jury says so. How did it go? She was his second wife. He claimed she had been acting nutty, and uh, so on that night she came at him with a revolver. So he grappled with her, it went off, and killed her. Hmm. That doesn't sound like the strongest story in the world. No, and especially since it came out that his first wife had died a few years before under what might have been suspicious circumstances. Drowning? Yeah. Well, my ex-boss, the DA, was politically ambitious. He saw a chance to get publicity. He figured there'd be no trouble getting a verdict of first-degree murder considering Walter Jones' past record. Well, what went wrong? Everything. Turned out the wife had been psychotic. She had threatened to kill him in front of witnesses. There was so much doubt, the judge made a directed charge for acquittal. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, if he married my daughter, I don't think I'd sleep nights. Well, Mr. Kellogg, what have you discovered? I've discovered that we can't take a chance. Oh, on what? No, that should be on whom? On Mr. Walter Jones. How do you mean that? He may or may not be a murderer. He may or may not have murdered his previous wives for their money. Is this what your client is paying you to find out? I was under the impression she wanted you to find him. If I do, she'll marry him. Oh, it's a free country. But I can't take that chance. I mean, suppose he kills her, too. She's very rich. Well, why not show her the record? Well, that won't stop her. She'll say he's being framed. Then what do you propose to do? I don't know. She's a woman who has a terrific sense of loyalty. Hmm. Then why not drop the key? No, I couldn't do that. Why because she just goes somewhere else, finds somebody else to find Walter Jones. Well, what happened to Walter Jones? No, oh, he'll turn up. What makes you so sure? Anyway, right now, I have a really pressing problem. Oh, what? When it suits his purpose, Jones will show up to marry Ann Trainer. There's only one way I can save her. How? I have to make her forget Walter Jones. 
Once again, Mr. Kellogg. How? How? Well, there's only one way. By making her fall in love with me. Well, here we have private detective James Kellogg, who may be somewhat out of his depth. From what you know of him, he's not the swashbuckling romantic hero. And yet, he is proposing a most swashbuckling romantic ploy. Well, he's never done anything like this before. Which means that Act 3 should contain surprises for all of us. is the conflict between desire and duty. For instance, duty compels Jim Kellogg to find Walter Jones. Desire would have Jim make sure Walter never shows up at all. Most people finally decide to yield to desire or heed the call of duty. Jim, on the other hand, has decided to do both, which means he will try to find Walter Jones and not find him at the same time. I'm not really sure I heard what you said, Mr. Kellogg. I said I would make Mrs. Trainer fall in love with me, Mrs. Haskell. Is that an ethical procedure, Mr. Kellogg? How can I permit her to marry Walter Jones? He, he may be a killer. Why don't you give her the facts and allow her to make her own decision? Being a woman, she'd only be confused. Really, Mr. Kellogg? Oh, I meant nothing deprecatory. I have every respect for a woman's intellectual capacity. Oh, thank you, sir. But a woman in love is a strange creature. That's because love itself is not a rational state. A revelation of the facts would only make her fall more deeply in love with Walter Jones. Why? Because it'd also give her a chance to be a martyr. She could say, you see, the whole world is against him, but I shall stand by him. From a practical point of view, Mr. Kellogg... How do you intend to make Mrs. Trainer fall in love with you? Well, I hadn't thought about that, but... There are several difficulties you would have to overcome. For instance? Well, Walter Jones is uh, quite tall. You are, oh, average. Height isn't everything. Mr. Jones is strikingly handsome. Where is he? Well, people are like fruit. It's not the outer husk or the shell, it's the kernel, the meat. The true substance inside. Well, from the conversations I have had with Mrs. Trainer, I understand Walter Jones talks beautifully and romantically. Mrs. Haskell, Mrs. Trainer will fall in love with me because it's the right thing for her to do. I've been trying to reach you for these past few days to see if there's been any progress. Oh, I was out of town, Mrs. Trainer. I'm so worried. Is it possible for a person to disappear without leaving a single trace? Look, it's noontime. I'll take you to lunch. No, I'm not hungry. I can't think of food. We might be able to discuss some important matters. Oh. If we're going to talk about finding Walter, then that's something else. I think that this is the first full meal I've had in weeks. I've been so nervous about everything since Walter disappeared. You know, you look very attractive when you eat. Yes? Oh, my goodness. Do you realize that was what Walter said to me? Walter? I was sitting in a coffee shop having lunch by myself when the stunning-looking man said to me, Do you know that you look very attractive when you eat? We both laughed. It was as if we had laughed together so often in the past. He was the kind of man that I wanted all my life. Oh, Mr. Kellogg, you've got to find him for me. You've got to. Promise. I promise. Good. Now let's hurry back to the office. The office? Yes, it's the most important place in my life right now. Why? Because it's the brain center, the place where the strategy to find Walter is being formulated. The phone should be ringing. Undercover men should be coming in and out. Well. I have no patience to do anything else or be anywhere else. And I I want to help. Help? Please. Let me. I, I could answer the phones, take messages, assist Mrs. Haskell. But. <laughs> Please. Let me be a part of it. I have an assistant. What can I do? She's the client. 
How is your campaign coming? Which campaign? The one that's supposed to make her fall in love with you. I don't know. Mr. Kellogg, my husband and I agreed that I would work here because we felt you were an unusually ethical man. Well, I try. Is what you're doing now ethical? What do you mean? You are being paid to find Walter Jones. I'm looking for Walter Jones. I am your private secretary. If you're doing any investigating, it isn't apparent to me. Well, what should I be doing? You should be out looking for Walter Jones. Well, by the same token, I could be in looking for Walter Jones. There is every possibility that he is a murderer. And I can understand your feelings. But you should confess to her. Mrs. Haskell, I'm doing this my own way. And it's the only way that has a chance of success. And what is that way? It's a line of investigation that has to be kept confidential, even from you. I hope you understand. Oh, I understand. It probably has to be kept confidential because it doesn't exist. Oh, I don't think I could concentrate on tennis, Mr. Kellogg. Well, fitness, that's a must for a detective. And right now, you are a detective. Well... Come on, come on. You need some air, some sun, some exercise. That's right. I must be strong for Walter. <laughs> That's out. Yep. I guess it was. That's game. Set. Match. You beat me. It was all I could do to even score a single point off Walter. Oh. <laughs> what a marvelous tennis player. And he had a killer instinct. He did, huh? Even if he was playing with me, he couldn't let up. He had to play all out all the time. Tell me about, uh, about Walter's killer instinct. Do you know anything about his past? Oh, I don't care about his past. He was honest with me. He told me he'd been married twice before. Mm -hmm. What else did he tell you? It's not important. Well, suppose it should turn out that he hadn't led a very exemplary kind of life. That's a very stuffy way of putting it. That's exactly how my late husband Edgar would have said it. Oh? Mr. Kellogg, if only you could learn how to relax. You and men like Edgar. Why don't you call me Jim? Oh, no. You're the Mr. Type. A correct, formal, proper Mr. Type. Good morning, Mr. Kellogg. Good morning, Mrs. Haskell. I don't mind telling you. But however lofty your motive, I thoroughly disagree with your tactics in this case. Ordinarily, I would have resigned in protest. I assure you, Mrs. Haskell... However, sir, you are about to receive your comeuppance. What do you mean? Mrs. Trainer is waiting in your office. Hmm? And I would say she appears to be somewhat miffed. Miffed? Surely you knew you were headed for trouble. Well, sir, it has finally arrived. What are you talking about? Why don't you ask her? Good morning, Mrs. Trennan. Mr. Kellogg, may I have the bill for your services rendered to date? Why, Mrs. Trennan? You've been very pleasant. You've taken me to lunch, to dinner, to tennis, golf, theater. You've done everything but look for Walter Jones. But I have been looking oh, for... Oh, please. I was married to a businessman for over 20 years. I know when things are being done in a business-like fashion. No work has been done in this office on Walter Jones. There have been no phone calls, no reports. It dawned on me that you're not looking for Walter. I asked myself why, and then I realized. You're in love with me, Mr. Kellogg. Do you admit it? Yes. Well, it's impossible. Why? Because I love Walter. It's quite possible he murdered two wives. It's impossible. I can show you the record. I have seen the record. Walter was completely honest. He told me the police were suspicious, and he agreed that they had cause to be. How did he account for his first wife's drowning? She fell overboard. It was foggy. He couldn't find her. You believe that? The authorities believed it. They refused to prosecute. One accidental death I might accept, but two? He was terribly lonesome. He needed companionship. He married in haste, and... Oh, she was a psychotic. It was obvious. And how will they account for your murder? I think that's despicable. All right, Mrs. Trainer, I am in love with you. See what I mean? You're in love with me, and you call me Mrs. Trainer. You weren't trying to find Walter Jones. But I was. Excuse me. Yes? Mr. Kellogg, I want to apologize. You were looking for Walter Jones after all. 
Emma Smith just called and said he's living at 19 Gladstone Oval. His phone number is 555-8308. Thank you, Mrs. Haskell. I want to settle up our account. Send me a bill. I shall hire another detective who will really look for Walter. That won't be necessary. I just found him for you. What are you saying? Do you want to know how? Your sister hired me to dig up his past. And I found his past record. I gave it to her. She obviously decided to confront him, scare him away. She probably paid him off. It doesn't make sense. If she has this record, why should she pay him off? The scenario. She shows him the record... He says, Anne won't care. She says, can you take that chance? Settle for a little, Walter. Take a few bucks and beat it. So he takes it. But he's going to keep coming back and taking more and more. And when he's drained her dry, then he'll show up and claim you and the main fortune. This is a most despicable lie. How do you think I found Walter Jones? I had a man watching your sister's house. Walter's been calling on her. I refuse to believe it. You don't want to believe it. Where is his phone number? Here, on this pad. Finally. Finally. And listen to me. He doesn't love you. He's alive. He's safe. Hello? Walter. Darling. Anne. Why did you disappear? Anne, I I began to worry that you might begin to think about my record and, and have doubts. Oh, you fool. You wonderful fool. Do you love me? Oh, Anne, I love you so much. Please come to my apartment. I'll be home in 20 minutes. I love you. I am so grateful to you, Mr. Kellogg. Send me the bill. He doesn't love you. He does. I can prove it. How could you prove such a thing? It's impossible. You don't want me to prove it. It can't be done. Walter and I are completely in love. All right, you're afraid, and I don't blame you. What would I be afraid of? Afraid to put his love to the test. What test? I say that all he wants is your money, and I propose a test that can prove it. But you're afraid. Now, I am sick and tired of the cynicism showed by you and my sister and my brothers. And everybody wants to brand Walter Jones for life. I'd like to wipe that self-righteous smirk right off your face. You know, if you have a legitimate way to put his love to the test, I'll give you the chance to go wrong. Oh, uh, is uh, Mrs. Trainer at home? Uh, she just stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, uh, she's expecting me. My name is Walter Jones. I'm Mrs. Trainer's fiance. Oh, well, won't you come in? Uh, thank you. Uh, are you a uh, friend of Anne's? <laughs> well, I'm afraid she wouldn't think so. Actually, I've been appointed a receiver by the court. What did you say? Well, since you're Mrs. Trainer's fiance, surely you should know what's going on. Say, what is going on? Who are those men? What, what are they doing? Easy, boys, easy, will you? For heaven's sake, don't chip that table. Well, it should be obvious, uh, Mr. Jones. Hmm? I'm the receiver in bankruptcy, and the men here are removing the furniture. You can put two and two together. No, no, wait. I, I'm not sure I understand. Well, it'll all be in the papers tonight anyway. It wasn't generally known. But Mrs. Trainer's husband left the company in bad shape when he died. They've declared bankruptcy. We've what? been ordered to attach Mrs. Trainer's assets, too. Mrs. Trainer's? Yeah. You know, her bank accounts, jewels, spurs, furnishings. Yeah, yeah, she was on the books, you see, as an officer of the corporation. Now, wait a minute. According to the law, an officer of the corporation is not responsible for... I see you know your law. That's true, ordinarily. But in this case, we have reason to suspect fraud. Oh? I think she'll be stripped clean. But she's lucky. she have you to take care of her. Me? Yeah, you said you were a fiancé, didn't you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you misunderstood. I said I was a friend of her fiancé, and I was passing through, and I... I just thought I'd uh, say hello. Well, sit down. I mean, she'll be right back. I'm sure she could use some cheering up. Oh, I wish I could do that, but I have a plane to catch. Hmm. Well, I'll tell her you were here. Uh, thank you. Uh, goodbye. Jim. Walter Jones dropped by to say hello. So I heard. I'm sorry. You win. I may have won the battle. Lost the war. No. When I saw the two of you side by side, I realized that I was really very happy with my first husband. I'm not a very exciting guy, Anne. Well, at least I can be sure of one thing. 
You'll never kill me for the insurance. And no woman who married Walter Jones could ever make that statement. Proving that we should all be grateful for small favors. Walter Jones is presumably still at large, happily married or happily bereaved. And yet, why are we coming down so hard on the man? All of it is circumstantial. He could be as innocent as a newborn babe. But don't bet on it. Don't bet on anything, except uh, perhaps on my coming back in just a few moments. look down, perhaps, on a beautiful girl who marries an older man for his money. But do we ever stop to consider why he marries her? True, she wouldn't marry him if he were poor. But would he marry her if she were old and repulsive? Why do people marry people? In retrospect, we have presented a story of marriage... And the moral is anyone you care to take away with you. We present these cautionary tales complete with morals seven times each week. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Patsy Bruder, E.V. Juster, Arthur Anderson, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Music. This is KIXI, Seattle. CBS News. There's been another one of those near misses in the air, the third such incident reported in less than a month. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The Federal Aviation Administration confirms that Thursday morning near Richmond, Virginia, an Eastern Airlines 727 jetliner almost collided at 19,000 feet with an Air Force F-101 fighter bomber. There were no reports of anyone being hurt. The Eastern plane was carrying an unknown number of passengers on a flight from Washington to Tampa, Florida. The FAA says the two planes came in what they term close proximity. The Washington Post reports the two planes were only 20 to 50 feet apart. There were two other such incidents recently, both involving two airliners. They occurred on November 26th and December 5th. More news in a moment. The Ford administration was busy Friday discounting a Gallup poll that showed Republicans favoring Ronald Reagan for the presidential nomination. The poll said 40% of the Republicans asked said they like Reagan. Only 32% favor the president. In Houston, Vice President Rockefeller had an explanation. Recognition factor is very important. If you're on the front page of two popular weekly magazines and you're announcing your candidacy and getting the kind of attention which has been given, I don't care who it is. He's bound to go up. This is, this is what I would call his moment. Rockefeller also told a GOP audience in Houston that President Ford is tending to the business of the nation. Voters in Australia are going to the polls to choose a new government. Results should be known in about five hours. Many of the polls predict the conservative coalition of caretaker Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser will win. The controversy continues over whether the supersonic airliner should be allowed to land in the United States. The British and French who developed the plane are trying hard to get such permission. There are reports the Ford administration is pressuring the Transportation Department to okay the SST. Nelson Benton has a report. 
Transportation Secretary William Coleman told a congressional subcommittee he is not being pressured by other government officials to allow U.S. landing rights for the British-French supersonic transport. But Coleman, who will decide the issue early next year, said that foreign policy considerations will enter into his decision. It seems to me that, that, that a factor that I have to consider is uh, the foreign implication effects. I'm not saying that that will affect me as much as something else, but I think I'm being very irresponsible if I don't. Coleman denied that a letter to him from Secretary of State Kissinger saying an unfavorable SST ruling could harm U.S. relations with Britain and France could be construed as pressure. Nelson Denton, CBS News, Washington. In Toronto Friday afternoon, a bus carrying commuters home stole on a railroad crossing. A train traveling at 70 miles an hour smashed into the bus. Eight people were killed, 20 others injured. Two University of Michigan economists are predicting that business profits will increase sharply next year as the nation moves out of the recession. Professors Saul Hyman's and Harold Shapiro predicted that the gross national product will rise 5.9% in 1976 compared with a 2.9% percent decline this year. Senator Frank Church of Idaho, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, says if he decides to seek the Democratic presidential nomination, he will resign from the panel, which has been probing such agencies as the CIA and the FBI. On Friday, supporters of Church filed papers with the Federal Election Commission to organize a committee on the senator's behalf.